In the Iliad, when Poseidon saves Aeneas, he speaks about him in a way that shows he has a future fate, though he doesn't specify what it is. He saves him and says, Come, let us bring Aeneas away from the grasp of death, averting the fury of Cronus' son if he learns that Achilles has killed the man whom destiny calls to escape from this fate. All this so that Dardanus's line may not pe perish in total oblivion. Dardanus, dearer to Zeus than all the rest of the children, Aeneas is to hold the rule of the Trojans, he and his children's children, for generations to come. In the Iliad, Aeneas is a cousin to Hector, and they are closely related in the story. He would have ruled Troy after Hector's death had not Troy fallen. So he was the legacy of the Trojans. And Poseidon refers to this in this moment, but we don't know how he's going to rule Troy if Troy has fallen. And thus Virgil picks up his story at this moment. One other anecdote that I want to relate about Aeneas and his character, um, W.B. Yeats actually tells a story about teaching Latin to a sailor and teaching this poem. And at one point he references the hero and says, you know, something about the hero, and the sailor looks at him in confusion, a hero? And he's like, yes, Aeneas, Aeneas the hero. And the, the sailor makes a, you know, a hero? I thought he was a priest. Um, so this whole idea that the character is so pious that he doesn't even actually uh, resemble a hero becomes kind of this passed down story about uh, Aeneas and the way that people perceive Aeneas in future readings. I'd like to examine Aeneas's character a little bit further in this idea of how fate and piety go together. What we get to see in the story is that Aeneas, in order to be pious to his fate, must hide his personal feelings from his public response and his public duty. So when his men land at the shore of Dido, and he gives them kind of this rallying speech. The, story, the poet tells us that inside he is sick with these colossal burdens, but he poses in front of his men courage. And we'll have this several times in the story, so be watching for this, in which you see privately he feels something, right? Um, for example, when he leaves Dido, privately he feels something, publicly he is stoic. And this, of course, becomes a Roman virtue. This idea that you're going to um, hold on to your feelings and not let it interfere with your public performance of duty. And we get to see this in the, narr in the narrative several times over when characters do not do this, when they do not suppress or hold back or restrain their private emotions and it gets in, in the way of the order of the public world. And this becomes then what will look like immoral behavior, at least according to the Romans. Uh, Lewis Marcos makes several points about the difference between Aeneas and the stories that came before him. And we've emphasized this a little bit, but the individualistic Odysseus needs only to ensure his safe return to Ithaca to fulfill his epic goal, whereas Aeneas will have failed his mission if he only returned to Italy. He cannot found Rome by himself. He would be overtaken by the Latin lines. Marcos says that Aeneas is less like a hero from Homer, whom the gods help because they are strong, and more like those of the Bible who are strong because God helps them. You do have a sense that there's nothing about Aeneas in particular that makes him worthy of the start of the Roman line. Rather, the gods have chosen him, and thus he does need to start the Roman line. Uh, it's more about his fate and his destiny than something in particular about Aeneas that makes him able to achieve this fate or this destiny. When Aeneas lands on the shore, he walks into Juno's temple, and he saw Troy's battles painted in their sequence, a worldwide story now. The sons of Atreus and Priam and Achilles, cruel to both. Trojan troops routing the Greeks, crested Achilles driving his chariot at the Trojans' backs. He saw himself among the Greek chieftains fighting. He saw black Memnon and the ranks of Don, Penthesilea, leader of the Amazons. 
This story should very much remind us of Demodocus' song when Odysseus is visiting the Phoenicians and wonders if they know of Troy, that if after 10 years of him being gone, um, they would have heard his name already and he can rightly introduce himself to them as the sacker of Troy. Here we have Aeneas wandering into foreign territory and getting to see a temple, first of all, assures him that these people worship the gods, they do have reverence, and um, the art on their buildings make him realize this is a cultured world, this is not a savage world as we have in the Cyclops Island, um, but instead they know the stories of Troy and they are passing them on. We also get to see mention of characters that were not in the Iliad, but do appear in other Homeric cycles, not Homeric, but in other epic cycles uh, that are related to the Homeric world. And so we have um, Penthesilea, who is a leader of the Amazon Queens. The, this is a warrior woman who will eventually have her model in um, Camilla in Book 11. She will look a lot. She's actually compared to an Amazon ruler when we get to see Camilla. And so we, we know that Virgil is drawing, or at least he's telling us as a poet, that he is not going to draw only on the stories of the Iliad, but in order to tell about the fall of Troy, he's going to draw on other stories. And so he sets this up for his audience in the opening when Aeneas is actually walking around Juno's temple. So we begin in media res, to use Horace's phrase again, where Aeneas is now starting his journey, but there are things that came before. And books two and three are going to tell us about what are these events that came before that have preceded this moment of him walking through Juno's temple. Two more notes about this opening scene in which he's walking at, uh, around Juno's temple. Because there is a temple of Juno, this becomes Juno's city. And later when there's animosity between Juno's city, Carthage, and the Romans, this will make sense to the Roman citizens who are currently um, kind of roiling still from the conflict they've had with Carthage over the years. And this gives a reason for why they would have had this animosity between those two cultures and those worlds. And so they would have been hearing Juno's temple and expected that, yes, Juno is the goddess who hates <laughs> the Trojans and who hates then later the Romans. And instead that she would have been worshipped here in what will become the future Carthage. 